and I feel like I went through my divorce alone. I was in the picture perfect marriage. Then I hit rock bottom and they were like, where does he live? And I was like, he's been living in Oklahoma. And I was just laying there and I remember thinking like, I don't care if I see tomorrow. I needed these moments. They're pivotal to who I am. Hi everyone and welcome to the Just Alex podcast. I'm really happy you're here and I'm really happy I'm here because I've wanted to do this podcast for such a long time, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted it to be. And then boom, one day I was like, it can be about my life. So we'll talk a bit more about what it is in a moment. But for now, my name is Alex. I'm your host. And you might know me from Mean Girl Pod, or maybe you follow me on Instagram, or maybe you're brand new here. So if you're new here, a little bit about, well, who I am a bio. So I'm 30 years old. I was born and raised in Edmond, Oklahoma. I went to high school here, went to college 30 minutes down the road, University of Oklahoma. I was that girl. I loved high school, had a lot of friends, played volleyball, loved sports, like just a really happy kid. And then in college, I loved college too. I wish I would have tried harder in college because I was that student that did just enough to get by. But I'm like, now if I could go back, I would take so many classes that interested me and I would try hard and I would actually get good grades. So botched that one. I love, I love, love, love to read. Um, Not fiction, not horror, not history. I love a good memoir. I love entrepreneurs. They fascinate me. They, they've all had like this failure story, which ends up in success. And I love reading about those. My favorite book I've ever read is Shoe Dog by Phil Knight, the founder of Nike. It, I read that book and it lit such a fire under me that I quit my first job afterwards. I was like, I want to be an entrepreneur. Um, I, you know, I have more Nikes than you. <laughs> Speaking of Phil Knight, I'm a shoe head. I am a content creator. Um, I'm a messy content creator though. A lot of content creators, they have a niche, right? Like you go to their page and you're like, she covers fashion. She's a food blogger. You go to mine and you're like, yeah, I don't know exactly what niche she's in. It must be whatever enters her head that day. And it is. I like it that way because there's no pressure for me to keep creating the same kind of content. So I like being a sloppy content creator. I'm also a podcast host. I co-host a podcast called Mean Girl Pod with Jordan Woodruff, where we started at Barstool Sports. I was there for two years. And then We left last year and I started Just Media. So I'm also a business owner. That's my favorite part of my day. I love owning Just Media because what we do is we produce podcasts. We basically do everything from end to end that a podcast needs to run. And it's really fun to work with these creators and give them a voice and then troubleshoot on the back end like what works what doesn't work? Because the thing about content and the thing about podcasts is it's an ever-changing industry. So no day, no day is the same. And I absolutely love that because this girl is not built for a nine to five desk job. I, I would get fired at one of those because I would just drive myself insane. So that's who I am. And now what is this podcast? More so, why am I starting just Alex? And that's because simply put, I'm an entirely different person today than I was two years ago. And I want a new podcast that's reflective of that person and my journey moving forward. So this is a place where I share those intimate details with you guys, where sometimes it'll be just me. Sometimes it'll be my loved ones, my friends, my family specialists, and we'll be talking about all those intimate details. And I'm going to share them with you guys. But but it's <laughs> it's been a journey the past two years. And so just Alex, this is the home of who I am today. And I'm really excited about it. So we're going to go back to the past because we have to, it's, it's largely shaped who I am today. And these stories will start to tell that. So when I got married, I, I had lived in Oklahoma my whole life and I got married when I was 25. I had lived out in Newport Beach, Orange County, California for a year, maybe a year and a half at the time. So I had just moved out there and then we got married uh, out there. So we go on our honeymoon and I remember sitting in 
the airport after the honeymoon and I was like ready to go back because this is who I've always been, right? I'm sitting in the airport and I start drawing up business plans for something called Accidentally Alex Diner. And it was a 24 hour diner that served breakfast all day because as I told you, I love entrepreneurship, entrepreneurs and business. And for a long time, I've actually kind of buried that love. But I think back to that story and I'm like, oh girl, you have always loved that. So I dropped those plans and I never obviously opened the diner. We go back to Newport and start our life as a young married couple where I wanted to start a business of some kind. So I create this charcuterie tray company called The Bees, which is individual six inch individual boards that are multicolored that you can connect together that can be one foot or they can be seven feet, depending on how big your party is. Uh, hot take doesn't solve a problem. Not a very good business idea, but I took it and I pitched it at an entrepreneur competition out in Newport. And I pitched the hell out of this thing and had my business plans. I had my prototypes. I had the whole thing set up. And they were giving away, I think, $20,000 to the winner. I didn't win. But the next morning, I get a phone call from the guy that put it on. And he's like, I got to hire you. Like, your brain works in a crazy way. And I have a startup. And it's a CBD company. And I want to hire you to be our head of marketing. So I'm like, okay. So I take that job, right, where I learned a ton. I'm telling you all of this to say, when I left Oklahoma, my wheels started to turn. And I was really hungry out there. And I loved learning and I loved trying things. I clearly was not afraid to fail because if my dad was listening, he'd be like, you lost all of those boards. COVID hit and uh, the manufacturer actually pulled out. So anyways, I was always a mover, a shaker, a doer. So then in the middle of COVID, I start making TikTok videos of my mom and those would go viral every time. I lived down in California at the time, but I would come home to Oklahoma. I'd stay here for a couple weeks and I would just make these videos of her. And I kind of walked into content on accident, but I loved it from the beginning because on the outside, you might think content is lofty, but it's really challenging because why does a video do well? Is it the first three seconds? Was it something I said? Was it that my mom was standing on a dead zebra rug and the comments are popping off about how she's an animal killer? Like, what is it about that video that did well? All the while, you form a community online. And a lot of people would comment and be like, I, you know, I lost my mom. I feel like your mom's my mom. And there's a lot of really fulfilling parts about content. So I start making content and I quit the job at the startup. And I give myself six months and I say, okay, because I was making good money at the startup the CBD startup. And I said, all right, I'll give myself six months. If I can do in content and make the same amount of money or more then I can do content as my full-time job. But if I can't at the end of the six month runway, I'll go back to corporate America and I'll get a marketing job. And in that time I sent a pitch, a video pitch to Barstool and Alex Cooper had just left and it was, that was call her daddy. So I made a pitch video called call your mommy. And I did a spinoff out of it. I was like, my name's Alex. Y'all just lost an Alex. Anyways, get the job there. So my mom, me and my husband at the time, we all moved to New York city. And you guys, what happened in New York was I realized I didn't know a place like this could exist. And I had hoped it had because what's in New York, New York can be what you make it. But what I made it was I networked, I read a lot, I would go see museums, I would, I would do anything I could. I was like a kid in a candy store, meeting people, making videos, trying new things. I, I just wanted to inhale New York. I absolutely loved it. And one thing whenever the divorce happened, what, what happened in New York was when we got married, I was the one who said, I don't know if I want to live away from Oklahoma. When we got to New York, I realized, I don't think I want to live in Oklahoma. I love it out here and the world's big and my eyes were bright and wide open. And I thought this entrepreneur girl, like I love it out here. I can learn so much. I find like-minded people and I loved it out there. What happened was my husband at the time, he didn't love it like I did. That's not a bad thing or a good thing. That's just a different thing. 
So he, he was trending in a different direction than I was trending. And for a while, I, I said I would move back to Oklahoma, but my heart was in one spot and my head was in another. So I'll tell you this story. While I was at Barstool, I competed in something called Rough and Rowdy, which is a boxing match. And I did that two years ago. And when I did that, we had said after I was done with the boxing match, we would start to try to have a family. And so I remember the boxing match ends and we're back in New York. It was in West Virginia. There's no headgear sanctioned there. So I fought with no headgear and I did win, by the way. So we're back in New York. And I remember saying like, well, what if we push it to like December? Maybe like I got some more gas left in the tank. Let me see what I can do before we start a family. And I remember what was really happening in my head was there was a divide starting, which is one part of my head was saying, Alex, he's going to want to go back to Oklahoma. You love it out here in New York. My next move's looking more like London or Tokyo than it is Oklahoma. And, you know, my, my husband at the time, he was trending in a different direction. And if we have kids together that, that binds you for life. And I did have the foresight to say, like, we do have a problem now. And I think there's such thing as a baby bandaid, which I've heard, which is where you have kids to solve problems. And, and I did know I didn't want to do that. And I remember thinking at the time, like, what is wrong with me? Maybe like, I don't want kids at all, which was interesting because I've always wanted four kids. Like I always say, I want a little army. And for the first time in my life, I had come to and been like, whoa, I don't feel this anymore. And that was alarming to me. And, and I was really sad by that, too. And I know he was sad by it, too, because what was happening with me was totally different than like what we had talked about when we got married. And at this point, I've been married four years. So back um, last year. So one part of my head is saying, you know, I don't. Oh, my gosh. I don't know if I can do this forever, which is a really scary thing for a girl from Oklahoma to think because also by society's standards, by my standards, I was in the picture perfect marriage, right? Nothing wrong here. Like on paper, you two meant to be, didn't it? But I didn't have like a tangible problem where you go to the book and say, oh, he did this, that results in this. And so I really, I felt guilty for almost having those thoughts. So that was one side of my brain, like the sirens were going off. The other side of my brain was saying, shut the other side up, Alex, because you don't have a choice. Like you're not going to get a, I couldn't even say it at the time. It was called the D word. Uh, no, I called it separate. You're not going to separate. That's not an option. So you better figure it out. During this period, I would call my family some of my friends, and I would start to tell them what was happening. And it was met with shock. I remember at one point I told my dad, I was like, you know, dad, I'm not so sure that I'm in the right marriage. I'm sorry, can you imagine? It was a bomb I had dropped on him because it kind of came out of nowhere for everyone. I remember I would start to tell my two best friends, and I'm not a big phone caller, so I'm texting my two best friends, and I'm saying, like, we're really having, like, we're starting to have some problems, and I think Graham and I are going, we're trending in different directions of what we want in life, and, you know, we were starting to argue over what those directions were and why we were feeling them, and and my friends were like, okay, you know, like, I'm here for you, but... They, they hadn't been through something like this and neither had I. So all of my friends and family kept telling me, and of course they kept telling me, Alex, strength is making this work. Like you can make this work. You guys can figure this out. And my mom was really good at being like, maybe he's feeling this and, and offer compassion here, Alex. And have you thought about this from his angle? And honestly, everything everyone told me had a valid point, right? But my best friends were good at being just ultimately supportive of what I was feeling. And I got to give it to them because they weren't really pushy on what I should do. They were very like, we're here for you. And my family was very like, you can make this work. And 
ultimately everyone was telling me like strength is holding on. But in my heart, what I found and what I really felt, because I would, I would get quiet every morning for like 30 minutes and every day, you guys, for six months, I had the same conversation with myself, which is life for you, strength for you is letting go. They were saying strength is holding on. My body, my mind, my spirits were saying strength for you is letting go, Alex. And it scared me to death because being from Oklahoma, be, being from a lot of places, actually, you associate divorce with failure. So that's what I did in my head. Like I felt like I was doing something wrong on every, on society standards, doing something wrong. But with Alex talking to Alex, what I was doing was right. And that was the first time in my life where I felt like a true divide of like what you should do versus what you feel and what you're going to do. So ultimately we decide to get a divorce. And what that looked like was a month of separation where my ex went um to one of a pl- went to a place where he grew up a lot they have a house somewhere so he would go there and I stayed in New York and we took time apart and the purpose of the time apart was to say like because because when you're getting a divorce guess what you want to do you want to check that you're doing the right thing so we separated and he came back to New York and he's like meet me for dinner so we met for dinner And we sit down and it's the last dinner we've had. I've seen him one other time since this. And we sit down and I, I was the one that had put it out there, right? It had, it primarily came from me and, but it needed, it needed to be not mutual necessarily, but this was one of those things that I I felt required understanding. And so he comes back to New York. He says, meet me at the Smith for dinner. So I meet him at the Smith for dinner I remember I walked there. It took me two hours to walk there. And I listened to Motown. And I just thought, I just kept saying over and over again, like, whatever happens, it'll be okay. And so we sit down at that dinner. And he said, well, what are you thinking? And I said, no, what are you thinking? And he said, I think you're right. And he kind of started laughing. And I was like, what do you mean I'm right? And he's like, well, I, I, I think we're going in different directions. And... I think you're right. I think we have kids. I think five years down the road, Alex, we're going to hate each other. And I was like, man, isn't that crazy? And we sat there and had like a lighthearted, but very sad, but lighthearted conversation. And we even laughed at one point and he was like, man, don't you just think it's the craziest thing? Like I'm going to be the one in Oklahoma going to Whole Foods And I'm going to see my friend from high school's mom and it's going to be like, did you hear Alex and Graham got divorced? And I was like, we would pick this. And we just, we almost sat there and almost laughed, right? So then he stays at a hotel and never comes back, moves back to Oklahoma. And, and you guys that seems, let me tell you what, it hits us about a month later, like a ton of bricks. So we make the decision and we're both kind of frozen, but he's living in Oklahoma and I'm living in New York, but we're separated and we know we're on the path to divorce, but like we are frozen. August hits. And I think that's when it hits, right? So we're apart when it really hits us. And that's when the sadness seeps in and we're scared and it's like then we have to face the reality of the decision we made which is like you got to file you know you got to figure out finances you got to divide the finances and you got to start calling like it took me a really long time to finally call my family and say (laughs) I didn't tell them he had moved out for a month because I was frozen in time just going through the motions And I was so disassociated and it was so traumatic for me that I would wake up like a robot and go through my day. And I remember finally I came to, no, my parents came to New York and I was like, Graham doesn't live here anymore. And they were like, where does he live? And I was like, he's been living in Oklahoma. They didn't know. I didn't tell anybody. And I didn't tell anybody because I couldn't face it. 
and I was burying it lower and lower and lower. So I tell them and I, I start to say, no, I'm sorry. I tell them, then I hit rock bottom where I, when I started telling people it was met with confusion, of course, because I had kind of gone silent from the part where we were having problems to the part where we decided to divorce. And I left a gap in there. So when I called my family and my friends to tell them they, they, were, as, they were as nice as they could be, but they were shocked. And that shock weighed on me and I crumbled. I went, I went on a vacation with my mom and I was there with her for five days. And I remember at one point she would ask me questions and I could like hardly respond. And I remember she was like, what's wrong with you? And I was like, I couldn't even answer what was wrong with me because it makes me want to cry thinking about it. But like, I wasn't there. Like my body was there, but like my brain was so gone. And I remember I went to, I would go to the gym a lot and I would just walk. And I remember I was walking on the treadmill and like it's how it, feelings were just oh, going back to this time. It, it overwhelms me, but feelings were just hitting me all at once. And I remember I sat on the floor and I called my friend Claire and I was just like in hysterics. She's like, what's wrong? And I just sat on the floor in the gym with the lights off. Like tears were streaming down my face, but like I wasn't upset, but I knew like I should be, but no one was there in my head. And it was this disassociation of like some, I was over, I was five feet away from myself looking at my body and I was just hysterical and my mom kept calling me trying to find me and I would just decline the calls and I was just laying there and I remember thinking like I don't care if I see tomorrow dark thought bad thought but it's what I thought and I hung up from her and I remember the person I called was Graham and I said I was like I'm so just distraught and sad and angry and he's like same right? Like we both were feeling it. We were feeling it in different ways, but divorce is funny because the one person that knows how you feel, you don't, you don't talk to anymore. And I talked to him a couple of times throughout, but you know, it was so jarring and I was so, my feelings had finally caught up to me. I had gone so numb. And I remember my dad called me. He's like, you need I think like a little bit more help. And I was like, I'll take you up on that. So I went from there to, I came back to Oklahoma for one night. And then the next morning we went to Canyon Ranch. He dropped me off and I stayed at Canyon Ranch. And I, I also did like a healing, uh, trauma patient recovery thing. And that's, that's, that saved me. Right. Because I needed desperately to talk to someone and talking to somebody every day for, I was there for eight, nine days, who was able to walk me through and, and kind of bring my brain back. And, they, and I still felt there, right? And they would walk me through, like, why are you getting a divorce? How do you feel about it? And like, I feel grief, scared, and ashamed. The path forward, while I'm at Canyon Ranch, mind you, Graham and I are, are working out, we're going to divide our finances, And so I'm doing that sometimes. And then I'm going to this therapy trauma and it woke me up. Canyon Ranch woke me up and it was like, get out of robot mode. And when I woke up, I felt raw and sad. And um, at the same time, though, I felt really excited and alive And my therapist there kept telling me that. She was like, you feel alive, don't you? And I was like, I do. And she was like, but you're not letting yourself. And I wasn't letting myself because I was ashamed because I felt like I had failed. But at the same time, you guys, not going to lie, a little part of me was really proud of me that I had the guts to do what was in my heart. And so I would feel all of these different things. And it was a whirlwind where I had shut off from a lot of people because 
I felt like if I was going to get through it, I needed to get through it with just me. And I wasn't going to pull the audience of what they thought. What happens on the other side of that? You know, one of my best friends came to New York. And I remember she was like, I'm, I'm at the hotel. And I was like, I'll come up there and see you. And she gave me like five and a five hour window for me to come see her. I remember on my way there, I called my mom and I was like, I can barely look her in the eyes. My mom was like, it's one of your best friends. And I was like, I know, but I just, I can hardly see people right now. I could, I went for about five months where I just didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want to explain what I was feeling and what was happening. And of course, you know, I get there and she just says, how are you? And I say, good. And she said, well, how are you really? And I just, my voice started shaking. And what I felt was so human but I wouldn't let myself feel it for so long and I just buried it. And when I woke up from burying it, man, you guys, like I, I think back on it and there are parts, my boyfriend today, Harrison, will ask me like about something that happened in May and I'll be like, I don't know. Like I can't remember parts of the past year because it was so traumatic and so my brain disassociated. On the other side of Canyon Ranch and figuring everything out, I moved apartments. I got screwed financially. <laughs> and it was the best thing that ever happened to me because it put me in fight or flight mode. And it made me say, hey, Alex, can you make it? Like... When it rains, it pours. Let me tell you what. I was like in the trenches taking grenades. And what those grenades were, it was like I had left Barstool, so I had lost my salary. And I financially, uh, Graham had promised me an amount of money and then didn't give it to me and didn't tell me till the very last day. An hour before the wires do, the money's not coming. Okay. I remember I called my dad and my dad said, well, honey, you can be mad about that or you can let it light a fire under your ass. And I said, we'll choose the latter. And it's, it's stories like that, you guys, that I tell to tell you, that's why I'm a different person today. And I needed these moments. They're pivotal to who I am because I sit here today and I tell you, I've made more money the past year, the past five months than I did at Barstool. And I'm proud of that. And I was never able to feel proud of my finances because they weren't mine. And now I tell you, like, I'll be like, back off because <laughs> I worked my ass off for that. And I'm proud of that. And I learned a lot of empathy. Like, I don't know how I existed beforehand, but I like lacked a bit of compassion. And I kind of thought... I didn't really think much about learned experiences of other people of the world and what, what you might go through. Like, I think if I would have met somebody that's like, I got divorced really young, I'd be like, oh, well, you could have make it, made it work. Like, we don't get divorced. Uh, okay, Alex. Well, now if I meet somebody that's been through that, well, we have a lot in common. And sharing that struggle was really good for me. And having to fight for myself and make decisions for myself was invigorating, right? And it taught me, like I always say, do it scared. And I think it could be lofty to some people, but I mean it. Because I did so much scared during that time. And, and so I started to come back a little. But my comeback was, I don't even know if you can call it a comeback. It was like, come new. Because I, I was in a place that I had never been before. I was in high school under my parents' wing, college under my parents' wing. The second I graduated college, I was under my ex's wing. And now I had cut ties with all that. And it was like, I was 30. I was living in New York. And I had cut my salary. And it was like, can you make it or can you not? And do you want to ask people for help? And my answer to that was not really. I want to see if I can do this. And there was a part of me, like the whole part of me knew, like, bitch, I kind of think you can. And I had a great couple months, right? I worked really hard. I took care of myself. Like I, I call it, I watered the plant and I, I still felt, you know, like I would have these really raw feelings, but I would allow them. And I, one thing I learned at Canyon Ranch was when you feel those really raw feelings, whether they're sad, happy, silly, just look at them and be like, welcome. And I learned to welcome my feelings back in and I came back to life. 
and I made friends and I went to really fun dinners and I met a lot of people. I would go out. I would stay in. I would go to movies alone. I would make dinner for myself. Like I just learned who Alex was without anybody else and just confirmed to myself day after day, like, girl, not only can you do this, but like you can do this well and you're going to be okay. And then started going on dates, some good, some bad, and went to Paris, booked a flight to Paris four days in advance. And I'm going to go to London. I'm going to go to Paris. And I, I was like, why can't I go to Paris? I've always wanted to go to Paris and I've never been. And it was like a moment I needed to get online and book it and prove to myself, like nothing is stopping you from doing anything that you want to do, but you. So I booked it and I went and I had the best time, like seeing the Eiffel Tower on my own account, riding the river in the middle of Paris, waking up and going to the coffee shops and going to these fun dinners and like living a Paris life for five days was incredible because it was my idea. It was my money. And it was so much fun. And then went on a date with a boy, fell in love with him, fell head over heels for him. And had I have not been in the right headspace and been just at the place I was at, timing was perfect, then I, then I wouldn't have been able to do it, right? Because there was part of me that thought, is this too soon? And then I realized, honey, we didn't come this far for too soon to exist. Never block your blessings, and I just, I met, I met a guy that I call magic and I'm so excited next episode for you guys to meet him and hear us talk and get to know him through his eyes and through my eyes and just us together. Because as I said, like I'm a new, I'm a new me and I'm a new me because of what I went through. But now the purpose of this episode and the purpose, not the episode, this episode, but this podcast is who am I now and what is this new era? And he's, he's a really big part of that. So I'm really excited for next episode. This is me wrapping up this episode. <laughs> um, you guys, I, I share today to say I have fabulous, I have the best friends in the world. I have a family who I'm incredibly close with and I've got a great community online and I feel like I went through my divorce alone to the fault of my own. Um, but I think it's hard to live it out loud. So if you're going through that and feel alone, no, you're not alone and you're normal and we're all human. And sometimes rock bottom is the best foundation to stand up on again. And so you guys from here on out, I will share my intimate stories. I will share what's going on in my life. I will share whatever it is that comes that week. But next week it's meeting Harrison, learning about us, learning about us together. And I'm really excited for that. I'm, I'm excited for this journey with you all. And I love you guys. Like I really do love you guys. And I'm thankful for you all. So I will see you next Thursday. Okay, guys, thanks for listening to another episode of Just Alex powered by Just Media House. If you enjoyed the show, which I think you did because you made it this far, don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, rate, and review. All of those things are so important. Stay connected on Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and Facebook at Just Alex Pod. Post production by Creative Evolution Studios. Theme song to the Just Alex Pod by Gideon Shockin and Denisha. I'm Just Alex, you're just you. Let's keep doing this thing. New episodes every Thursday. Oh,